Welcome to today's GSP InformaTech webinar, Mastering Quality, Building a Strong Foundation for Your Pharma Startup. Thank you for taking time out of your busy schedules to join us. Next. We have an instructor for today's webinar, Stephanie Golding, General Manager at PharmaTech Associates. Welcome and thank you to you. I will now turn the presentation over to Ms. Golding. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to come and speak with everybody and share some of my thoughts about um, building a, a strong quality foundation in a, in a pharma startup. And I want to start by really kind of emphasizing at the beginning of the conversation that, you know, one of our main missions really in any, whether new pharma company or for even those of us who working for companies that have been around for um, decades or maybe even a century or more is really centered around making sure that we deliver quality products. And uh, I think when we look at the uh, generation and evolution of thoughts into kind of modern quality concepts, uh, we look at and understand that fundamentally quality needs to be built into the product that we can't test. Um, quality into the product at the back end, right? So there's no way if we didn't build it the right way, if we didn't infuse quality in along the way, we can't add that back in at the last minute. It's not like baking cookies or um, or breads where you can make some fine tune adjustments and, and get that recipe right. If we don't do it right from the beginning, um, you know, it's not always something that can be corrected on the back end. Um, so I wanted to start our conversation there because it's this concept that that as you're building and as com as people who are are forming um, new companies and have these great ideas of new innovative therapies, uh, that this really is kind of at the heart of what we're going to talk about today and make sure that every that everybody from leadership all the way on down to um, the lowest positions in the organizations has a central. Uh, unified vision of quality and how um, the processes support um, building quality quality into the products as we as we go through. So with that, really, where I want to start is is inevitably um, what happens in the genesis of a new innovative idea is somebody goes and and starts a company. Um, but one of the first kind of questions that tends to happen in that product lifecycle uh, journey that companies go through is really about when and where do I need to bring in a quality unit? When do I need to hire a quality person? Um, when do GMPs apply? And I thought we'd start our conversation addressing that question kind of right out of the gate uh, because it is one of the most fundamental um, challenges that a new startup organization will, will face. And realistically, uh, when we look at this, um, fundamentally GMPs apply to any and all products intended for human use. And so, you know, this concept that you can go into clinical studies that can be out there amongst startup organizations and not have a quality group and not use GMP principles is, is definitely misfounded. It's, it's kind of a, it's really kind of a myth. Um, you really do need to have GMPs uh, employed, and therefore it really begs the question as part of part of one of the central themes of GMPs is having a well-defined quality unit. You need to um, put those in place before you actually move into human studies. Um, so this definitely applies to having a quality unit to support everything from um, IND, initial first in man studies, um, all the way through um, the later pivotal trials and then into commercialization. So once you establish a quality unit, it will be there in perpetuity for, for the length of the company's existence. What's different in many of these stages is interpretation of some of the requirements across the GMPs. So we're going to talk about when we talk about um, where do you find the people to fill these roles and, and how do you find them and what to look for? Uh, we're going to talk about some of the attitudes and mindsets that are, are needed. Um, certainly when you're dealing with um, clinical stage um, production um, oversight of clinical studies, there is an application 
of um, general quality management requirements um, using and GMP requirements using what we call scientifically sound and risk-based based approaches. It doesn't mean that all things are created equal and that the full element of GMPs as would be required for anything that's approved for commercial distribution uh, would be required. For example, you know, one of my classic examples is you wouldn't implement um, complaints procedures and recall procedures in the same level of formality um, down to patient levels if you're really in clinical studies. Those are things that are typically implemented in later stages. Um, but a good quality unit, and particularly in many startups, finding a good uh, quality leader understands that phase-based application of the GMP requirements and can really help navigate um, the formation of an established quality unit that's appropriate for the organization and their manufacturing strategies. Now, when we talk about quality units, um, really interpretations of what this is <laughs> varies from time to time, um, and we'll touch on what that means. But I want to start really with senior management because they are integral um, in the formation of startup organizations and really set the tone uh, for everything that goes on, including the attitudes around quality and building that foundation, foundational culture that is ultimately going to be looked at and evaluated um, in inspections by health authorities. And so I want to talk about five core responsibilities that live with senior management before we kind of go into the specifics about the quality unit structure, you know, who you hire, um, some of those kinds of uh, more nitty gritty uh, approaches and elements. And we're going to start with really this first concept being just general leadership. And this is really a fundamental tenet. And I think we would expect this of all of our senior leaders in any kind of startup, the founders in particular, that they are demonstrating that they have a commitment to quality, right? First and foremost, I, I often use the term and, and hear people use the term that they're going to walk the talk. Um, they really are demonstrating those attributes in the culture that they want, the company organization that they want, and the attitudes towards quality that they want the organization to have. And one of their core responsibilities is really the alignment of that quality strategy with the business strategy. So a lot of times we look at our founders and our, our um, chief executive officers, our chief science officers, in companies or, or maybe the head of R&D and say, okay, well, they're driving certain pieces in the business strategy and where we're going with our products and our pipelines, but they're equally as responsible for that strategy and vision around quality plans and principles in the organization. They also need to focus as part of their, <clears throat> their leadership on driving priorities. Where should the company focus? In its early days, it may look different, it may function different, its focal areas may be different than in latter stages of a clinical study uh, journey, for example. Um, it's also important for leadership um, to not only ensure that the necessary resources available, so it's really this group of people that's responsible for making that determination of when am I going to establish a quality unit? When am I going to hire in those first couple of quality folks? Um, how is that going to evolve as part of the organizational's evo organization's evolution? But they also need to, to be able and willing to advocate for continual improvement because you're going to start your journey as a startup in a certain place and you're going to want to evolve um, your quality management system, your quality practices, and your business strategy to adapt as the company goes through its product development uh, journey. And of course, one of the last fundamental responsibilities for leadership as leaders in the organization is around communicating. Uh, and we'll touch on this again when we talk about um, establishing the, the quality policies. Um, it's clear that leaders need to communicate in their companies. And again, we, I go back to that walk the talk. It's not just sufficient for them to say the words, but they need to have the behaviors echo the words that they're saying. So it's really important that, that the leaders recognize that their leadership is a core piece of their responsibilities um, in, an, in an organization like this. Uh, when we look at um, the next responsibility is really to set up and structure 
the organization for success. And I'd say that's a general responsibility of leadership in any company. But when we look specifically as it relates to uh, quality units and establishing a quality function, uh, one of the key pieces here is that they need to establish an organizational structure for their quality unit that remains its and retains its independence from manufacturing, from R&D. So this typically means if they don't have um, the structure in place at their founding, that at some point they add in someone into the organization and the leadership level that is responsible and champions quality. And it kind of starts there and really we'll talk a little bit more about, you know, how to structure, how to consider structuring um, quality units themselves um, in the next couple slides. But um, it really is management's job to make sure that that organizational structure exists, that quality maintains its independence. Uh, you know, we have that unit has certain jobs and responsibilities. Uh, they need to be empowered uh, to make those uh, decisions. Um, as they're developing those structures, they need to make sure that they're well-defined and documented and that there's very clear lines of responsibility and accountability in the organization. Um, when those lines are really fuzzy, uh, it can lead to confusion, which can often lead to um, people making assumptions. Maybe somebody else um, has that task or activity. It's not my responsibility directly, and sometimes you can miss some things. So it's important to think about that organizational design, even as a small startup organization. Um, you know, it's one of those pieces that that I kind of look at as it's a never too early to be thinking about um, what the organizational structure looks like today and what it might look like as you evolve through the, the journey of product development and bringing products to the market. So the next fundamental responsibility, um, and it may seem a little bit kind of abstract, but it's really about um, establishing a good quality management system. No senior management does not need to sit there and write procedures and um, dictate everything that needs to happen within the QMS and every process that needs to be written down. But what they need to advocate, advocate for is that they have a robust QMS for their organization that is, in many cases, phase appropriate for where they are in their product development life cycle. So that you've got the necessary procedures in play to support the critical activities that you're you're advancing through your first in human studies through uh, later stage clinical studies and then as you hope to uh, commercialize your first product um, so that really involves two primary things um, from my perspective one is to establish what i refer to and many refer to as the scope of the quality management system this is often driven by the boundaries of the business strategy. So for instance, if you're a, a startup um, biotech company and you're going after um, an innovative therapy that's a, a gene therapy, right? You're gonna be looking at establishing a quality management system that enables the processes that are necessary to support that development journey and then ultimately the commercialization journey. That looks different if you have maybe a drug product. There may be similarities, but there are also some differences. And that's gonna look different again if you've got a combination product where maybe you're pulling in elements of medical devices. So you need to understand the scope and nature of the product portfolio that you're working with. The other dimension of scope on establishing a um, QMS and defining that scope for the organization is to look at um, really where you're targeting marketing your products. And with that, what I mean is, are you gonna be US focused and US centric? Um, some companies um, will often pick a primary country to launch in, or maybe they envision that their product is only gonna be the US, or maybe they want US and Europe. Um, those regulations, while there's a lot of similarity, there are some differences and that difference needs to be accounted for in the quality management system. So when you think scope of your QMS, kind of think two primary things. What types of products am I going to make and where am I going to, where am I going to um, deploy them? Where am I going to market them? Um, and then with this, they really need to just encourage the development, be supportive of the development of the QMS. And that's not just through communications, through behaviors, through actions, but down to providing the resources, establishing a QMS for anybody who's ever built one from the ground up where there's been nothing uh, in place um, beforehand, knows that it takes resources, it takes an investment to get that QMS up and running. 
Um, it takes resources to sit and write procedures. Um, you can contract that out. You can use in-house resources. You can use a blend. Um, but the leadership and the senior management of the organization needs to be supportive of those activities taking place and not put them like some companies might have a gut instinct to on the back burner. You want to develop that QMS as you're developing your product um, and bringing that forward uh, in that journey. The next piece is what I refer to as a commitment to quality. Um, I, you'll see this is everything from quality plans, quality objectives, quality policies, um, all of those different elements. But really what this is about is really establishing and being dedicated to quality in the organization. And it really starts with, for most organizations, taking a look um, at their mission. So most startup organizations, you know, have a desired mission, you know, either they're often pursuing maybe a very specific therapeutic area and they're really catering to that patient population. Um, you know, but in any of those avenues, there's room to work into that mission, the vision, um, and articulate that quality is valued by the company and the organization and the senior management team. And it starts at that, that really high level mission for the organization and then moves down into the translation by the management team into a quality policy that, that really starts to dictate what those core objectives are. Um, which can lead to corresponding measures and, and those types of things. Um, but it's really in that establishment of a written commitment to, to quality and then ultimately circling back to leadership, living that commitment to quality um, through their day-to-day -day behaviors that is, is really incumbent uh, upon the leadership team. And the last piece of this, as you might guess, um, if you're familiar with what this, this takes and what this looks like, is really to review um, on a regular basis, not just the quality management system and the attributes in the quality management system, um, but <clears throat> look at the quality policy, look at the corporate mich mission periodically. Are those still aligned with where the business is going? Do they still reflect the quality uh, mantra within the organization? Do they reflect the culture um, towards quality of the organization? and be courageous enough to update them where, when and where needed. It's okay as a uh, new company forms and evolves that sometimes those views may change. They may add uh, differing patient populations. They may add uh, more product types to their portfolio. Um, all of those pieces should be part of what senior management is looking for and reflecting on to make sure that their attitudes towards quality are all encompassing. And I think the last piece of this that I'll, I'll touch on, on reviewing regularly is it's also important for the leadership group to understand what I refer to as a larger picture of what's going on in the regulatory landscape or regulatory intelligence. And the reason even for a startup company, it's incumbent and, and important for the management team to understand what's going on in that landscape is that new requirements kind of can pop up. Um, at any point in time. And sometimes those requirements are related to clinical studies or related to um, maybe a change in approach to uh, manufacturing strategies. And those could affect the overall product development timeline if they're not aware of them, if they're not responding to them as the, the signals are detected that, that something is evolving or shifting in the landscape. So even in the early days of a startup, understanding what's going on in that regulatory landscape is really incumbent upon uh, senior management to have that complete understanding so that they can make sure that these five responsibilities are well integrated and aligned um, with the business strategy. And so with that, we kind of move into establishing that quality unit, right? So one of those, those core pieces that management needs to do is is to set up an independent quality unit. And I wanna talk a moment about what is a quality unit. Um, so this is language that we see in a lot of um, regulations and guidance documents from, from health authorities around the world. Um, some of them have moved into kind of this more modern uh, interpretation of a quality unit uh, that I'm gonna talk about here. Um, some of them have not, they still use this, this older language of, of a quality unit. So if I'm looking at FDA regulations in particular, uh, you will see quality unit referred to uh, in the regulations. And really this is both the blending of 
the testing element or what we might traditionally call quality control with what we might um, in modern times refer to as more quality assurance functions. Both of these pieces encompass what uh, health authorities look at as a quality unit. So it is important when you're building a quality unit and a quality organization that you consider both of these pieces. And so first you look at quality control. Your organization needs to have the ability to um, test and assess and make disposition about really any kind of raw material that's coming in, um, you know, components that are coming in, um, any, type, any type of intermediates or uh, in process materials, as well as the finished product itself. Um, really looking at and evaluating the performance of batch over batch of a product's manufacturing uh, history uh, for conformance to specification, right? To double check and make sure that, that um, we're adhering to those specs, or if not, that we're investigating why something uh, departed from those specifications and um, ultimately feed into um, the disposition of the particular lot. Um, and ultimately, um, while they may not actually do an activity called <laughs> batch release, uh, the quality control groups via all of the testing that they do, all the data that's generated, are generating a large portion of the the data that is used to, to ultimately determine the acceptability of each batch. Um, and all of that is compared against uh, specifications uh, and limits. When you compare that to kind of what our modern views of quality assurance functions are, um, really that's kind of a checks and balances, right? So I kind of in simplest terms say quality control, control tests products and, and components and quality assurance does a lot of verification activities. Uh, so they're going to be the group that typically reviews and approves procedures, um, production, maintenance, um, consult your local regulations for any others that are specifically mentioning a quality unit approval. Um, they're also typically articulated that they have to provide a review of associated uh, production records. Uh, so typically as part of doing batch release, uh, you'll get somebody who's actually doing a detailed review of the, the batch production records. And whether you're manufacturing that um, within your organization or you're choosing an outsourcing strategy, that responsibility still exists within the startup organization as the, the drug sponsor. Um, it, it's, it is something that they do expect um, to have happen. Um, to do release or rejection of finished product for distribution, that could be to the clinic initially and then ultimately to um, the commercial market once the product is approved. And then again, that, that really kind of what I think of as that formal check and balance system is doing audits, um, whether that's vendor audits, supplier audits, internal audits, and looking at trends uh, that come up in an organization. Both of these pieces are what is typically referred to as a quality unit. So when you look to design and implement quality functions within an organization, it's important to understand uh, that you need both of these capabilities, and it's often not in a single individual. It's usually in um, at least two individuals or potentially more, depending on um, the complexity of your organization, um, your manufacturing strategy, your testing strategy, et cetera. Um, so even if you're outsourcing, you still need these capabilities within your organization as a potential drug sponsor. You can't outsource these functions to a contract testing lab or a contract manufacturing uh, lab. You still have to have that capability in-house. And <clears throat> from there, um, one of the things that while it's, it seems a little odd to talk about and think about when you're starting your company, um, but at some point, um, especially when you wish success for, for all of these innovative products in the development uh, pipeline, uh, one of the questions that ultimately starts to, to come into play as you get um, multiple products on um, in the pipeline uh, for development, as you start to look at um, complexity of your outsourcing or manufacturing strategy, your, your uh, testing strategy, um, at some point you start to look at how your quality units are going to be structured. And this applies to both the QC function and the QA functions. Um, and 
neither of these centralized or decentralized is employed, I would say, exclusively in most organizations. Uh, usually there is a level of, of combining these elements uh, in the right kind of balance for that organization. Um, but really, when you look at a quality unit structure, you know, centralization means there's one group and, and kind of in its purest form, only one group. Um, that is centralized for the entire organization. And that could be whether the organization's 10 people or 50 people or 1,000 people, right? That it's all of the quality functions are centralized in a um, core group of folks. Uh, this does require strong quality leaders um, to understand the scope and breadth of the organization and to be able to evolve with that as it, as it evolves. Um, usually when you're using a centralized approach, you deploy standards and guidance, which um, business units and um, CDMOs, if you're outsourcing, uh, will follow um, and requires a strong um, quality culture or is tends to help enable a strong quality culture, uh, especially when you focus on attributes of that culture being, you know, clear accountability, open dialogue, um, you know, speak up kind of uh, cultures, um, continuous improvement, and just general openness or, or transparency. Um, this is a lot easier to obtain in a centralized um, quality unit structure uh, than if you move into a decentralized uh, structure or towards decentralization. Um, things to watch out for when you kind of consider these kind of structures um, in a centralized fashion is just kind of looking for um, potential for bureaucracy um, and micromanagement to creep in. Um, you know, sometimes when you have these centralized uh, groups, structures get put in place, processes get put in place, and they get really rigid. Um, sometimes when you're a startup, you need flexibility. You don't um, need a lot of bureaucracy. You need to be able to adapt to the evolving landscape of the organization, the evolving compliance requirements. Um, so you certainly um, want to be aware and be on the lookout uh, for those types of, of issues to pop up. Uh, you can also struggle with talent. Um, and by talent, I mean human resource talent. Um, you can have or source the wrong kind of talent or, or uh, you could develop, um, choose to develop in-house talent, but it may mean they may not have the experience um, to make decisions independently and may be strongly reliant on a central quality leader, which is why that's so important in these kind of organizations. Um, and I put on here is just watch out for what I call microcosms of the culture, um, places where even though the quality is centralized in the organization, maybe when you get out, um, and this tends to happen where a quality group tends to get a little bit siloed from everybody else in the organization. Um, so they're centralized, but they're separate. Um, you can get these microcosms of culture that start to form where uh, R&D is interpreting things in a slightly different way and, and production is looking at things differently and, and um, the quality group has, has got this expectation. So you just want to be on the watch out for um, those pieces to, to develop in that kind of a structure. And decentralized um, quality units are exactly the opposite. Um, they are really developed as a company grows out of its its early startup days into multiple products, multiple uh, maybe manufacturing capacities, maybe some in-sourced, um, some outsourced. Um, you start to get into very specific quality groups that are tailored to uh, very specific business objectives. So you get some a quality group that's overseeing just the outsourcing uh, ventures with um, CDMOs or, or contract testing labs. And you get a different one that's focused on in-house manufacturing. Um, you kind of start that evolution. And then, you know, if you've got a really successful startup, um, it can get more complicated. The more products you get, the more uh, manufacturing bandwidth you have, the more decentralized it can get. And while that has its benefits, and, you know, a lot of times people like some of that autonomy that can come uh, with a decentralized approach, uh, in those cases, it's really important in a decentralized quality unit structure um, to ensure that you define some high level metrics and measures that are used across the board, um, that everybody's aligned around those definitions for those metrics and, and measures. 
um, and that you spend time sharing best practices. Um, I've worked in a lot of decentralized or heavily decentralized structures before. Um, and the reason I put this up here is that, that you could gain a best practice from your own internal benchmarking, going and talking with another quality unit within an organization um, and really gain efficiencies, get better by leveraging those best practices into your own group. And so that becomes a, a behavior and a part of the culture in decentralized organizations to really drive at sharing, sharing those best practices internally. Um, and really decentralized means having that well-defined sufficient authority at whatever that, that unit operation level is, what I call the local level in the slide. Um, and that the quality unit has that independent authority, but that again, guarding against them getting siloed um, away from the rest of the organization or even potentially away from each other. That's the risk in the decentralized is that they get siloed away from each other. Um, and the watch outs in that kind of model are disjointed systems, which leads to inconsistent practices, metrics and measures. Um, you know, if we've ever, if you've ever been a part of an organization where you go inspect or go look at one business unit and how they handle change management, for instance, and you go into another business unit and you look at how they, how they handle change, it's completely different. <coughs> that can create um, differences in interpretation. Um, it can lead to inconsistency in the metrics and measures that you're trying to evaluate uh, the overall quality organization on. Um, the other kind of watch outs are much like the microcosms of culture, you can actually evolve different attitudes towards quality therefore different quality cultures by having completely segregated quality units. Um, and then you can also get into a situation where there is a potential for somebody to try and override the local quality unit. Um, you know, they're, they're not as empowered, maybe they're siloed, uh, maybe not as independent as they could be. Um, so watching for um, situations where, um, not to say that people do this, but you know, production, R&D, somebody is trying to override that local quality unit, um, there is that risk for that to happen. So while you're an early stage, when you're an early stage startup, this seems like a really foreign concept. You're not, you're not too concerned about centralized versus decentralized. The reality is for some companies that journey, especially if you've got a product that's moving quickly through um, the clinical space because maybe it's a breakthrough therapy or it's a rare disease therapy and it's it's got some special accelerated um, regulatory pathways you could very quickly find yourselves in an unplanned situation of having what i might call a hodgepodge quality unit with just kind of evolved without a plan you're better off putting a plan and putting some thought into um, into how you would evolve your quality unit structure as the organization evolves. And again, part of this is really leveraged with, with senior management, but I would say this also kind of lives as a shared responsibility with the lead quality, um, the head quality, head of quality as that's hired into uh, the organization. Uh, so we've talked a little bit about, you know, what is a quality unit, what makes up a quality unit. So we're talking about the same kind of things. We've talked about you know, senior management's responsibilities. We've talked about how to structure things. Um, but often when you go to hire um, your first quality person, this is probably one of the biggest challenges that startup organizations facing is not just hiring the first person, um, but even the, the early hiring. How do you understand who to bring in, the right fit to the organization, the right fit for the journey? Um, and so I wanted to talk a little bit about how you go and find and select those employees to form your quality unit and to deliver on those capabilities and responsibilities. Um, first and foremost, um, you know, finding technical people, um, quality people does require a level of skill in the recruiter it's themselves. Um, you know, there's a lot of recruiters that are out there that are freelancers. There's a lot of recruiting companies. You can have your own recruiter um, if that's the way your, your leadership is, is functioning in your organization. But whether that's an internal hire or it's an externally outsourced um, function, uh, make sure you, you look for recruiters that have a successful track record with filling quality positions with the right kind of people. 
Um, there are a lot of recruiting organizations that are out there that might just provide resumes and don't do a lot of fit matching. So, you know, one of the one of the things I like to screen recruiters on is, you know, how do they identify candidates to match my position? Um, and I'm looking for answers beyond just, well, they have these few keywords in their resume. Um, that's not somebody, that's somebody who's going to provide me volumes of resumes, but as a person who has lived and worked the startup mentality, I need somebody who's going to partner with me and do a lot of the screening for me because I have limited hours in a day. And if I need to find a good quality person, I need them to help do some of that screening. So I need that experience in finding the right kind of folks. Um, there is always an option. Some people ask me, well, can I just outsource the quality function? Well, that answer is simply put, yes, you can. Um, <clears throat> you can outsource the quality function at least for a period of time. You're still going to have to have somebody in the organization, in the leadership that's designated as the quality person um, that ultimately can take care of some of the core responsibilities um, as somebody who's paid um, and an employee of the company. But you can outsource a lot of different things. You don't have to bring in enough people um, to do every aspect of your quality management system. You can outsource things like audits. Um, you know, you can outsource things like batch record reviews. Um, there's, you can outsource testing for that matter. Um, so you can consider outsourcing as part of your strategy. Um, and that's where, when you're looking at that structure strategy um, that we just finished the, the conversation on, if you're going to deploy outsourcing, you're inherently moving towards a decentralized quality model. And again, it's not bad. It's just do it intentionally and make sure you put into place um, structures and communication cadences, et cetera, that keep all of those various elements that you've outsourced connected so that you still have one quality unit. Um, <clears throat> one of the other foundational pieces when you're going to find quality employees is um, really understand what you're screening for. And there's two primary aspects when you're looking for people to fill quality roles. Uh, one, um, they really need to be at what I call adders to your culture. They need to, to work in conjunction with the established culture in the organization. Um, but with that also comes this huge foray of technical capabilities that especially in a first hire, uh, you're typically looking for, and that's hallmarked by strong understanding of the science, um, especially for the products that you're um, developing and bringing to the market, um, bringing, bringing to the market manufacturing and delivering some uh, products produced by synthetic chemistry is extremely different than those that are produced uh, through traditional biotech techniques. And that's even further different than those um, that are produced by uh, gene therapy methods. So understanding the background of science uh, that is necessary for a person to, to have um, as part of your quality organization uh, is important. Um, you also want to understand their, their, their natural risk tolerance. Um, I, I teach a course uh, through ISP on, on risk management. And one of, we spend a, a good time talking about risk tolerance individual level, organizational level, et cetera. And everybody, guarantee you whether you thought about it or not, you have an inherent tolerance towards risk. Uh, you're either running and jumping at risks and really open to new opportunities and, and, and embrace that, not saying that you don't think about it, um, but you're way more willing to pursue um, and accept risk than maybe others are. Um, and I think about it just just for a quick analogy, when you look at people driving cars, there are all kinds of different drivers that are out there. And the bottom line is they're all taking different risks. They're making conscious or unconscious decisions all the time about the risk that they're taking. And that exhibits in their behaviors. So you want to understand a potential quality um, unit employee's perspective on risk. Does it align with the organizational perspective? If the organizational perspective is super conservative in, in accepting and taking risk, um, bringing in somebody who's maybe a little bit more risk tolerant or more willing to accept certain risks um, could lead to frustration for the employee and vice versa. It could be the opposite. If you bring in a head of quality, let's say that has a more conservative view on risk than the organization does, it could lead to healthy tension, but it could also lead to unhealthy tension. 
Um, the other key technical attributes that I like to, to look for in these early quality employees is really great problem solving skills. Um, those of you who've been involved in startups um, before, like me, you know that there's nothing but problems that, that come up that need to be solved. Um, that's part of the development journey. Um, so you need to be good at problem solving, which leads to you need to be good at critical thinking skills um, and thinking outside the box that you might be thinking and being willing to, to look at things from different, different ang angles. Um, you also need strong um, teamwork and collaboration skills. And probably the last, but not, not at all the least important, it's probably actually one of the most important for startups is people who understand that there are certain boundaries that are established by regulations and guidance in our space, but there's a lot of gray that exists out there in interpretation and ways to approach things. And um, those grays manifest themselves, those gray areas manifest themselves a lot in startups. So if you've got somebody who thinks in kind of what I tend to refer to as this black and white thinking, it either is or it is not, it's often not that binary. Um, it's much more blended, it's much more gray. And so seeing and finding people that meet all of those criteria and that you've spent time thinking about those attributes before you actually start to recruit for and find um, your first quality unit employees, um, that'll put you off on the right um, foot. Uh, beyond that and uh, beyond engaging recruiters, um, you've got the capabilities to post on uh, really any kind of job boards to go to professional societies around the world and advertise your positions. There's lots of ways to, to try and attract talent. There's also um, something that works really well often in um, startup organizations is the personal referral network. So encouraging, you know, the employees, the leaders in the organization to reach into their networks to just even approach people about whether or not they might be interested in joining them. Um, it's not unheard of in the circles that I I work in my network to, to see groups of people move from startup to startup. They just enjoy that environment so much. And one of them goes and then they start to bring and collect everybody else and they go on to their next adventure in a new startup. So um, networking is certainly something that is, is uh, very valuable in finding the right talent um, that's out there. And I think as we look at um, our journey through our conversation today, and I, I do want to leave a little bit of time here towards the end for, for some opportunity for, for Q&A. So if you haven't thought about that, if there are questions you want to ask that may be on your mind, whether I talk to them or not, um, uh, certainly go ahead and start entering those in the conference's I.O. piece. But um, as we look through this, we've talked about, you know, senior management's role in establishing a quality unit and a function. Uh, within a startup. We've talked about the quality unit. What is it? You know, some considerations um, and some watch outs for establishing structure. Um, we've also talked about, you know, how do I actually go find the physical people to fill those roles when I, when I need to. Um, and I don't want to underestimate this. This is probably actually one of the biggest challenges, especially in today uh, that we face. Uh, finding talent and good talent is is a struggle around the world. Uh, we're seeing that um, and continue to see that. Um, but that last piece of really establishing a quality unit that I, I want to touch on is this this ever and never ending question that always pops up when I when I start to talk to people and they're getting into their first um, startup is um, what about my QMS? Does it am I OK with a paper based QMS? Um, Am I okay with um, electronic QMSs? And uh, we'll talk a little bit about that. And I, I forgot that I had one more point I wanted to talk about, which was also around governance. So we'll talk about governance first, and then we'll move into this QMS conversation. Um, but as you bring in your quality unit, and you're establishing your quality unit, um, <clears throat> we talked about as one of management's responsibilities, uh, really that, that review piece, um, that periodic regular review piece. Well, part of this is really making sure that the necessary governance and oversight gets established as part of establishing the QMS, as part of setting up the quality unit. Um, because as you see on the, as the picture tries to illustrate, there is inherent governance that's in place, even in a small startup that drives the business strategy. So you have executive management, you have 
um, roles and responsibilities getting defined. You know, you're you're looking at risks to the business. You're monitoring. You're establishing a level of policies, policies and frameworks, and and it's all kind of centered on this vision and mission and, and business strategy. Um, so there's inherent business governance that always exists, even in a small startup. But this is also a good practice to employ as you move into um, establishing a quality unit and really to provide that that strong foundation for a quality culture. And one of the best governance practices is really that review process that that exists. But it's not the only thing we talked about establishing a clear organization um, with clear roles and responsibilities that includes who's got the ultimate decision-making responsibilities. There are some things that in some countries, the regulations say that have to be made by our decisions that have to be made by a quality unit. To take that responsibility and put it in production is not a viable option. It has to live in the quality unit and they need to have the, the empowerment and the accountability to actually um, take those and make those decisions. And this governance of the organization needs to make sure that that stays in place, that that doesn't get overridden by some um, process change along the way. Um, strong governance in the organizations can also um, de-silo and increase the connectivity of the groups. Um, I've come from and I've worked in uh, large pharma, um, but even I have found as I've moved into smaller pharma and startup organizations, it's amazing how quickly siloing can happen. Um, it's a conscious effort to be what I would call inclusive of the entire organization and recognizing um, if you're in R&D, how your work impacts those that are downstream and vice versa. If you're in a quality unit, which is often kind of frankly at the very end of many processes, you know, what does that mean if you don't have early signals, early detection? Um, you know, that typically creates more work. So if you can de-silo and increase the connectivity, build really good relationships across organizational functions, even in a small company, and I would say especially in a small company, you set this really strong foundation and expectation as you grow forward to maintain that connectivity. And it just de-risks the potential for silos forming. Um, one of the other pieces around governance, which I, I've maybe hinted at, but I didn't touch on clearly enough. Um, so we're going to talk about that really quickly is making sure that there is a process for escalation from the lowest position in the organization or what I call the floor of the organization all the way up to the CEO of an organization. Now in a startup that may be 15 people, that may be a very easy thing to do, but as the companies grow, that escalation process typically is going to get a little bit more structured and more um, defined as you go forward. Uh, so making sure that as your startup grows, that you're looking at escalation processes, making sure that the right risks um, and issues uh, funnel their way up um, appropriately. Um, and the other piece that I am a strong advocate for, even in an early, even in a startup organization, is developing regulatory intelligence systems and processes. Fundamentally, regulatory intelligence is about staying ahead of what's coming next. Um, your basic GMP education will tell you that GMPs don't stay the same year over year, that there is always an evolution. Um, that's kind of why the C is in front for current good manufacturing practices. It's always looking at best practices. Um, you need to know what those are. You need to know what's coming. You need to know what's trending. The only way you can do that is by either, again, outsourcing so you get that information fed into your organization or developing the capability within your organization uh, to do exactly that, stay ahead of what's coming next. And then the last piece, and I'm just going to spend a few minutes talking about um, the electronic quality management systems because this is part of um, a decision around your approach um, to a QMS, and it may even be made in some companies, especially some startups, um, by the senior leaders in the organization um, about whether or not they're going to pursue an electronic version of a quality management system. You know, there are really kind of three general themes of how you can document your quality management system. You can do it on paper, you can do it as a fully electronic system, or you can do what we call a hybrid. It's somewhere in between. It uses a little paper, it uses a little electronic. Um, as a startup, um, do you need an EQMS um, 
not necessarily I'm always going to give an answer in a lot of these cases. It really depends. Um, what I encourage folks to think about in a startup organization is what is your operating philosophy? What are your short term and long term needs? If you are a startup that is completely virtual, creating a paper based QMS or even sometimes a hybrid is challenging. It doesn't make a lot of sense, especially that purely paper based QMS. Um, regardless of your choice, though, um, and we did a, a separate uh, webinar with USP education on data integrity. Um, so I encourage you if you, you're not familiar with that concept or want some more information um, about this concept, but data integrity co controls were, are required regardless of which type of methodology you deploy. Um, they're just gonna look a little bit different in a pa purely paper-based world than in a fully electronic world. Um, so the bottom line is I can't tell you necessarily whether in your, your company without some discussion uh, could benefit, or maybe it makes sense to, to do an EQMS, but I can tell you that there are options that are out there. There are plenty of companies out there that still operate purely on paper. Um, but the more virtual you are, the less physically present you are as an organization, you're going to move into a hybrid or potentially even into a fully electronic system. And it's never too early to implement one. Um, a lot of times companies will wait until they get further down the development highway. Uh, there are a lot of inexpensive, simple QMSs that are EQMS solutions that are out there um, that are low cost, easy to implement, get you up and running in weeks, not months or years. Um, so it doesn't have to be your end all EQMS solution. Maybe you get a starter EQMS and, and work from there. Um, so these are all kinds of considerations that, that I really think are important as you look at um, establishing and building a quality unit, building, a, building it from the ground up. Um, a lot of different touch points There are even more beyond this, but not necessarily things I could cover in an hour and still leave some time for some Q&A. Um, so I really appreciate the time that you guys have taken to, to listen to me talk today. And um, I'm happy to move into taking some questions um, as we go through this. Uh, if you need me, um, you can reach out to contact at, at pai-qbd.com and they'll get your, your inquiry directed um, directly to me if you've got a question that comes up after uh, today's session. Um, and then we'll kind of move into um, uh, questions and there's a number of them which I'm going to I'm going to hazard that in six minutes I can't get through six questions but we'll start with the one that's got the most um, <clears throat> most votes and um, we'll kind of work our way down so the first one um, if you don't jump into an into a QMS or I'm assuming that um, maybe an eQMS um, when at what stage would you recommend a startup go and implement one um, well, you need a foundational QMS from the beginning, but it can be paper. Um, as I was just talking about, I think the, the mantra there is really around the organizational design. So if you really are a virtual organization, you're going to find that, that even implementing some sort of hybrid system gets complicated really fast. Uh, the data integrity controls that you need, um, the deployment of secure storage locations versus e-signing methodologies. At that point, you're probably better moving right into an EQMS. Um, I would say, you know, in today's day and age with the, the types of quality management systems that are out there in, in, in electronic solutions, um, I think you can get into it in the really early stages. And sometimes it's actually a lot easier because you're collecting all of the data. And it's not just about potentially your procedures, but also look at building in and collecting your audits and your CAFAs and your deviations and your change controls. You know, take advantage of a lot of those systems. They all kind of come with those core uh, fundamental uh, capabilities and they're not all terribly expensive. You're not talking about millions of dollars anymore. You know, some of these you, you, may, you may get in the price point of of you know tens of thousands of dollars per year versus hundreds or larger thousands of dollars per year um so just to kind of wrap that that one up um the next one uh would you recommend the qc group to report through qa or cmc when you have a small group that utilizes contract organizations um uh, <laughs> uh so if you're manufacturing um, 
so it, it can be a little bit tricky to have QC reporting in through manufacturing or CMC. Uh, if your CMC group is really focused on um, development and you're completely, as this question might allude to, that you're completely outsourcing uh, your manufacturing activities, you could have a small QC group potentially report through CMC. Uh, what you're going to need to be able to defend uh, if it's that way at the time you go to to apply for uh, approval of your first product is how they maintain their independence and autonomy from the manufacturing element or those in the company that are responsible for manufacturing. A lot of companies, when they start in their really early days, um, there may not be a lot of difference between their CMC group um, that is especially that's responsible for analytical development and that that is overseeing maybe outsourced QC testing. That's okay. At some point, you're probably going to want to evolve to a structure where you have a dedicated QC group, um, or at least a person responsible for that. And ideally, um, either have both the QA and the QC person report up to a head of quality, or if it's too early for that, maybe you've just got um, a quality manager and a QC manager. You know, maybe it's okay for for a little bit for that. Um, group to embed themselves with CMC. Um, so it's not super clear determination. There are risks if you go to have them report in through, through a CMC group. Um, but as long as the organization understands the risks and on some level is, is willing, if they need to make a change to make a change, you can certainly do that. The ideal structure is really to have either them reporting in through QA or um, establish a head of quality and branch immediately into a QA QC function. That's the most ideal uh, structure. And then I think I got two minutes. So I'm going to try and take one more. Um, I joined my first startup as their only quality person. I'm struggling to figure out where to start. What advice do you have? Um, and there's, I'm actually going to couple this with the next one. Is there a specific guide or reference detailing the basic needs of a QMS and where to truly start? Um, these two are kind of related, in my opinion. Um, if you're in the US, uh, the FDA actually has several um, guidance documents to, to actually start to outline some of those philosophies. One of those is referenced in the presentation. So um, I tried to put the, the clear link so that you guys could type that into the web and, and get to that, that direction. It talks about um, the QMS um, structure, the quality unit structure, leadership responsibilities and points to some other guidance documents. So it's a great starting point um, for starting. Um, if you're looking for more specific guidance beyond that, what I can tell you is one of the best places to start is sit down and have conversations with the, the senior management team, understand their vision, and then put a plan in place to start to build out your quality management system infrastructure and understand that what it may look like um, the day you start to build it and what it's going to look like um, later in the journey is going to be very different. Um, and worst case, if you're really struggling, there are people like me out there, there are groups, there's LinkedIn groups, there ASQ's got a, a whole community of folks that, that focuses in pharmaceuticals. Network, um, talk to people, um, build a, a, a network of support so that you've got the opportunity to ask the questions, especially if you've never worked in a startup and you're really, really struggling. Um, that networking is really valuable in helping you chart a journey that's specific to uh, your organization. You've got the time to ask the questions, the time to have the conversations, um, et cetera. So I think that that takes care of those last two. Um, and the last question, I'm not going to have time to get into this. <laughs> Um, I will get a written response to this one to USP Education, and they'll get that posted uh, in the education platform and available. This is a little bit longer conversation than we uh, have time for uh, since we are at the top of the hour. Um, I do appreciate everybody's time um, and sticking with me, and I appreciate USP Education for hosting us again. Um, enjoy doing this, and I hope everybody has a great day.